So, hello everybody, um, and welcome to uh, Jazz Festival, and to today slash tonight's special event, Commonweal Resilient Scotland. How can Scotland recover from COVID? Um, Jazz Festival, for those of you who are aware or maybe aren't aware, is Edinburgh's Arts and Human Rights Festival, and we are celebrating our 21st anniversary this year with a special stimulating and packed programme. Uh, before we start, though, I'm going to take you through some housekeeping. Uh, tonight's event is a webinar, uh, which means that you won't be able to see or hear each other, um, but you can obviously see and hear us. And as part of seeing and hearing us, or more specifically Craig, uh, we encourage you as much as possible to comment and ask questions uh, from Craig. Um, you can do this by going down to the bottom of your screen where you'll find a menu bar and clicking the Q&A button. Uh, and my job throughout the evening will be to keep an eye on that and to pose uh, any questions from there that will come up. We'll have a dedicated uh, period for doing that at around uh, 7 p.m. approximately. Um, but yeah, I'll be looking at that and preparing things. So please, as soon as something pops into your brain that you really want Craig to answer, just mention it and we will uh, make sure it gets asked. Um, and so now to talk about our wonderful speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Craig Dizel. Is it Dizel? D yeah. DL, the, DL. Mi the middle five letters are silent. Wow, not confusing <laughs> at all. So, sorry. Dr. Craig DL, Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal, a people-powered think and do tank in Scotland, uh, developing policy on and campaigning for social and economic equality, for well-being and the environment, for quality of life, for peace and justice. So uh, never a dull day. Um, and today, Craig is going to be talking about Resilient Scotland, a plan for Scotland to recover and rebuild society after the pandemic based on good jobs, economic equality, environmental sustainability and social cohesion fueled by a green reindustrialization. And so without any further ado, Craig, I'm going to pass over to you. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me at this festival. It's, it's, it's always good to find new and interesting venues um, to, to speak at, even if they're all coming from my living room at the moment, <laughs> which has certainly been one of the big changes of the last uh, year or so. Um, although I have to say one that I'd like to keep going because uh, it's just actually quite good for the environment to not have to travel everywhere. And as much as I like to see interesting places around Scotland producing a lot of carbon doing it, I'm not so sure it's the best thing. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you can all see this oops um if anything goes wrong in this just have someone shout at me um and i'll i'll try and fix it as it is i when i've got this screen sharing on i can't actually see anyone so i'm gonna have to rely on uh one of our hosts shouting at me if something goes wrong why do we need this and it's not just about covid because what covid did was not so much create the problems um, that we've, we've, we're seeing in the economy, or, um, but it exacerbated a lot of the problems that were, were already there. A lot of the vulnerabilities in our economy came out because of this pandemic. And it's something that we've seen over and over again. When Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister, he promised, uh, when he was the Finance Secretary actually, when he, in the late 90s, he promised the end of boom and bust. And we've had three busts since then the dot-com crisis, the financial crisis, and now the pandemic. Every time we have one of these economic collapses, we hit the ground, we try to fix things, and sometimes we do fix things and, and fix the thing that went wrong in particular. Notice that the banks have survived the 2020 pandemic better than a lot of us have, um, and they've certainly survived it better than 2008. But mostly we just kind of wait for the next crash to hit. We're not trying to fix the fundamental problem of having an economy that's just not resilient to these problems. I couldn't use it for copyright reasons, but there's a great comic out there of someone looking at the shoreline and they see this small wave come in of the financial crisis, and a larger one of the COVID pandemic coming in, and then an even larger tsunami of the climate emergency coming in behind that. I think that's slightly the wrong analogy. The previous crises were, were like waves that came in, but they go away again. The climate emergency is more like sea level rise. The tide's going to come in, the sea level's going to rise, but it won't go back out again. Countries are going to disappear, species are going to disappear. The carrying capacity of the planet is going to reduce permanently. 
we need to we need to fix these problems before they happen. Prevention is the cure here. So Commonweal has been trying to do our part for this. We published in 2019 the world's first fully comprehensive budgeted Green New Deal for any country in the world. We believe it's still the only one. And that formed the thinking or thinking in 2019. Obviously, within weeks of that coming out, the pandemic started to arrive and we had to start thinking about, right, we're not starting from a position of stability, we're starting from a position of crisis. So in 2020, we started our Resilient Scotland programme. And our first paper in that, produced in June uh, 2020, was Resilience Economics. This is the kind of theoretical underpinning of that programme. And it said, what is your economy for and why should it be resilient and where should it be resilient? It should be economically resilient. It shouldn't boom and bust. It should be socially resilient. Whenever it busts, whenever our economy busts like it did in 2008, it disproportionately hit the people who were least able to cope with that bust. You saw a lot of the same thing happen with the, with the pandemic. And we should be building an econ economy that's environmentally resilient because if we kill the planet, it doesn't matter how much wealth we're generating for the shareholders. So we've generated a series of principles that we should base the economy on, sufficiency, well-being, cooperation, diversity, participation, transparency, opportunity, how decentralized your economy is, because no matter how good it is, people do kind of resent being told from the center what to do by a, by a single person. You can't build at people, you must build with them. And we should be measuring an economy along those lines. How useful are the things that we're doing? How much resources are we extracting from the planet? How much waste are we creating? How much democratic control do we have over the decisions we're making? Notice that in these metrics, GDP growth, which is currently the only metric that we measure the success of our economy, isn't among them. You hear people talking about green growth or sustainable growth or inclusive growth. We don't think you should even be doing that because you're still pinning the economy on growth. If, as a result of making the, the economy more resilient or greener or more circular, growth happens, great. But if, as a result of well-being increasing, growth decreases, the economy shrinks, but everybody is happier for it, that's also a, a positive outcome for us. So what does the Resilient Scotland plan look like? It's actually three parts, and one of them slightly outdated because when we wrote it, we were looking at trying to come out of the, the, the pandemic before the elections in May. We're now past the elections in May, but we've still got this pandemic around us. So that timeline has shifted slightly, but we believe a lot of the lessons are still valid. We then have a, a plan for starting to build this Green New Deal in this current Scottish Parliament from 2021 to 2026. Um, there's a lot that we can't do at the moment in Scotland, and there's a lot that will take longer than five or six years to do, but we want to start preparing for that. And then after that, the, the next parliament, we spend about 20 years implementing the rest of that Green New Deal. So it's a long-term plan. We are looking at a, 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 a plan that does actually take us up to the 2045 target for becoming a net zero country. So we've seen some of the things that we need to do to get out of the, the COVID pandemic. It, it involves doing more of the test and tracing. It involves um, uh, much more in the way of pandemic control than we've seen. Um, but fundamentally, it's, it's doing what we're doing, but better, and trying to do it in a way that isn't so hampered by the, the restrictions of the current UK political setup. We do need the Scottish Government to have more, more in the way of borrowing powers so it can finance a lot of the initiatives that we need to do to get out of that pandemic. Although we do have some um, uh, advantages in that we now have a national investment bank that can do a little bit of that lifting, but it's still very underpowered and it could be improved. What do we want to do once we've controlled the actual um, pandemic itself and we move into the economic recovery phase? we're looking at urgent stimulus in the areas that have been hardest hit. I mean, international tourism is likely to be drastically curtailed for years to come. 
So we want to try and improve the Scottish uh, tourism, domestic tourism sector. We've suggested give £100 to every person to, to stimulate staycations and give people a chance to travel around Scotland and see our own country. Similarly, vouchers to, to try and boost local small businesses and, and, and restaurants, not chains. We need local uh, stimulus, not money getting funneled into tax havens. We want to have an artist basic income to support, especially the artists and creatives who have seen a lot of their gigs disappear. And we want to have a festival, festival of Scotland to try and get people back out again and get people seeing these artists. So things like the Just Festival, things like the Edinburgh Festival, great, but let's have a, a, an even bigger party once it's safe to do so. And we've got more practical things for people struggling with their, their rent or their mortgage and, and, and other schemes in the, the plan that um, if you're reading the whole paper, I highly encourage you to, to look for. Then we start looking at the more fundamental, the more, the, the, the more boring behind the curtain stuff, like start to reform public procurement and how, Scotland, how the Scottish government gets the, the, the stuff it needs to invest in building programmes. Right now we have a very intransparent, very unresilient method of doing that via PFI and its successor programmes. And we've seen the failures of them hit everything from food to energy and housing. Once we get to this the, the past that crisis phase, though, we want to get into the Green New Deal. We have to recognise that if we want to hit our, our 2045 target of being net zero, we need to start doing some of the work now. We can't wait until after the 2041 election. The limits of devolution are tight. They do prevent Scotland from doing a lot of things, but they don't prevent everything. So what our principle for this phase of the, the Resilient Scotland Plan is to work out what parts of the Green New Deal can we do now and start doing them. Everything else, do as much as you can. Take them up to shove, as close to shovel ready as possible. Build on those previous principles, uh, especially around procurement. What we can't be doing is importing our wind turbines from halfway around the world. What we can't be doing is allowing our, our entire energy sector to be foreign owned. Um, the, there was news today about uh, uh, the launch of a new Green New Deal training um, agency. We've actually argued for exactly that. Uh, we want to have a, a publicly owned national infrastructure company to provide that kind of training for the people who's gonna, who are going to be building these new renewables and doing things like building Green New Deal homes and insulating and retrofitting existing homes. The difference is this new academy is owned by Scottish Power, which is a private company sort of, some of its shareholders involve publicly owned companies. So actually this new trading academy will be partially owned by the public. It'll just be the Norwegian public and the Spanish public, not the Scottish public. So not exactly what we're aiming for. While we're making our economy resilient, and reducing these boom and busts, we have to start making our democracy and our society resilient as well. We need to decentralise. Scotland has the least local, uh, least local layer of democracy uh, of any country in Europe. What we call our local authorities, most countries in Europe we call their regional authorities. We don't have the kind of municipal level democracy that is normal everywhere, everywhere else in Europe. So we need that kind of layer of democracy. We have a blueprint for, for that that we've called development councils. We need to bring back public retail banking, banking for non-profit and for and, and that can bring stable relationship banking to our high streets and our communities again, rather than the, the kind of mobile phone app based press button get loan type transactional banking that has been very, very profitable, but not very stable. We need to democratize. We're seeing some of this in the form of the, the citizens assemblies that have launched in Scotland. Uh, Commonweal fed into the, the, the recent Scottish Climate Assembly um, to, to great effect. A lot of our policies were picked up there. It's great to see these initiatives happen and we should see more of them. And we need to deepen our policy. We need better ways of coming up with government policy. So we are advocating for a network of policy academies to, to, to drive that kind of development as well. As I say, 
this is going to be a 25 year plan to bring in the Green New Deal. So we need to start now. And actually, in actual fact, we're already running late. We published this in 2019 as a 25 year plan. It's now most of the way through 2021. We need to make the circular economy a priority. We need to bring in tool libraries and the national leasing service so that we're not buying cheap throwaway one use items anymore. What we can do is instead borrow high quality goods that instead of sitting out in our own drawer and never being used can be constantly used, thus getting more use out of a single item. But because the tool library is buying better stuff than we can afford, we get better tools. Our DIY well-being increases, even though we're not buying cheap power drills anymore. We need a national resource strategy and national waste strategy to, to drive down the amount of materials that come into our economy and, and leave our economy as waste. Right now, only about 5% of the materials that come into the Scottish economy are recycled once. Everything else leaves the economy as waste or pollution in many cases. We need, to, we need to close that, that resource loop. By the end of this parliament, or at least even by 2024, we should have everything up and running or as close to it as possible. We should have met this challenge to use the powers of devolution as to, to the greatest effect we can. The next step on the Green New Deal really depends on Scotland having the powers to, to, to take them. So we advocate that by or before 2024, Scotland should have another independence referendum and a good chunk of that, that question should be based around the Green New Deal, because what it should say to people is you have seen the changes we have already made, we want to continue this journey, we need independence to do it, if you vote for independence we can finish the Green New Deal, if, you, if not, if the people of Scotland still don't want to take that step, effectively we'd have to scrap everything we've done up to that point and rely on whatever the UK government and the other side of that campaign is offering and rely on that offer being delivered. Right now, it looks as if it's in an even less well thought through state as the Scottish, Scottish government's plans currently are. Assuming those powers come, either by independence and Scotland taking on the plan or by the UK taking on our plan in a, uh, in a modified way, the shovel ready projects can begin. Everything we've started can continue. Everything we want to start can start. A lot of this is going to be laying pipe uh, for our new energy networks or heating networks. It's going to be retrofitting every house in Scotland that needs to be retrofitted up to Green New Deal standard. It's going to be reforming our agriculture sector to, to make that sustainable. Um, it's going to be reforming the way we do trade because we want to reduce the amount of imports coming into Scotland and shortening our supply chains and using more of what we create here. So that may even reduce our exports, becoming a much more domestic economy. We've estimated that the total price tag for the Green New Deal will be about 175 billion, which sounds like a huge amount and it is, but what we've also estimated, that if you borrow that over 50 years and pay that back over that 50 year time, time span, it will cost about five billion pounds a year. But the Green New Deal itself and the jobs it creates and the revenue it creates from things like nationalised energy companies, it will bring in about six and a half billion pounds a year in revenue and profits. So this is a plan that pays for itself. What changes? Put yourself in that position 20, in 2045. What's now changed? The quality of life is better. You're working less and you have a culture of borrowing and leasing things instead of buying and throwing away, so you have more time to enjoy a better life. Your work is a lot closer to your home. I, I like the fact that I don't have to commute to work in every day anymore. I, I now work from home permanently and save two hours a day in, in, in travel. Not every job can be worked from home, not every home can be worked from, although we have a plan for that as well in the, in the form of local and hot desk and office hubs. Hopefully, if more of us do this, it allows us to embed in our community and become part of our community rather than just sleep in it. Our plan involves a national pharmaceutical company and a national care service that will strengthen and support the, the National Health Service. 
And less pollution and other environmental damage means we'll have less need for all three of those. Your health will be better as part of the Green New Deal. It's not just a plan to fix the climate. The country will be fairer. Tax and the, the, the powers to change the tax system and change them to focus on well-being and not growth or pandering to tax avoiders will lead to a better, fairer country. Obviously, I can't give you an, uh, the, the nuts and bolts, perfect detailed picture of what life will be like in 2045. It would be about as challenging as standing in the night of the 1997 devolution referendum and saying what, the, what Scotland would look like in 2021. I wonder if anyone did that. I'll need to go back to the news archives. And just finally, again, to stress that this plan isn't just about the Green New Deal. It's not, not just about fixing the climate. It's not just about decarbonising. This is about one aspect of using that Green New Deal to create a Scotland that doesn't just fall over at the next crisis, as we have done in so many before. It's about one that is resilient and lasts and one that we want to live in. There's much more to say about this. I really highly encourage people to check out our, our Green New Deal plan um, and, and go through that and work and see what, what else changes and how to change it. Uh, what I will say is once we're done, we'll wonder why we ever delayed. We'll wonder why we didn't start 20 years ago. And very finally, please visit our website, cottonwheel.scot. Um, you can find all of the policy papers um, that are included in, the, uh, in this presentation in the Resilient Scotland on the Green New Deal and all of the papers that underpin all of those papers. You can find them in our policy, policy library. They're free to download. Please visit our shop, buy copies of the book. We have a book on, book on independence and how we build a country after we vote for, for that called How to Start a New Country. And we have a book, a wonderful atlas of opportunity that really shows Scotland in a a very interesting light, and uh, uh, you, you should consider having a look at that. Or if you want to donate to Commonweal, you can also do that there as well. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to rattle through a very extensive policy programme in a very short period of time. I'm happy to stay as long as you need me to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Craig. I think I speak for everyone when I say just how uh, fascinating everything that you've been talking about and everything in the presentation is. Uh, lovely attendees, please keep your questions coming in. We're now going to start posing them to Craig. So I'll start with some of the ones that I am seeing uh, in this lovely little Q&A box, and we'll just go from there for the next 20 odd minutes. Um, sure. So I'll start with this first question, um, or I apologize, by the way, um, to whoever asked these questions, all of the questions are listed in this box as anonymous attendees, so I don't know who asked what, but uh, they're all appreciated. Um, but I'll start with this first one, which says, what do you think the new coalition between SNP and the Greens will do effectively? Mm. Oh, very, very good question. I actually have a, I have a, an interest in this, I should declare, I, I'm a member of the Scottish Green Party, so I will have a vote on on this deal on uh, on the 28th. Um, under the, the rules of the Green Party, the, the this deal has to be approved by members before it goes ahead. Um, don't think I'll share which way I'm voting quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Give us a taste. <laughs> uh, it is a tricky one. It's, it's one that is still in active, active discussion within the party. Coalitions or even cooperation agreements, because I'm not calling this one a coalition, uh, it falls somewhat short of a coalition. There's always that risk that the smaller party ends up taking the blame for everything goes wrong and the larger party takes the credit for everything that goes right. Um, the, which is exactly what happened to the, the Lib Dems in the 2010-2015 coalition. Um, I hope that won't happen. Uh, I hope it will be a, 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 a much more consensual collaborative relationship. What, what it does seem to have done so far in the, the documents that have been released and the, the shared policy agreement is push the SNP to, be a, to go a bit faster on things that it was already kind of in favour on, but didn't feel it had the, 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 the push to go for quite yet. So 
we could see more of that. I'd like to see that go even further. You'll notice that the, the plan I presented it um, there probably goes far, goes far further than even the Greens are suggesting. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it can do some of that quite well. I'm not sure what will happen if the coalition is put under strain. What happens when, if, for example, there is something in that excluded area of um of policy like aerospace um um and subsidies and things what happens if the SNP want to push that the greens opt out and the conservatives vote for it alongside the SNP where does that leave the cooperation could be interesting times <laughs> Uh, and a follow up to that, uh, Helen uh, has said, stop the new oil rig, question mark. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, not sure which oil rig that's specifically referring to, but uh, you might know think, more about that. Mm, I think the that refers to the new Campbell oil field off Shetland. There's a really good paper by um, Friends of the Earth Scotland pr produced a couple of years ago that said if Scotland wants to meet its Paris Accord, uh, climate targets then of the oil that is out there in fields that we haven't yet tapped including that Campbell field 100 percent of that oil has to remain in the ground so if Scotland is serious about meeting its climate targets that field cannot be opened nor can any fields that are out there that we don't know about so no new exploration and the fields that we're currently tapping at least 20% of the oil in them has to stay in the ground if we want to meet our climate targets. So maybe that's something that could come out of this cooperation agreement. We've started to see some nudges from the SNP just going a little further than they're used to in oil and gas. But it's going to take a lot more to, um, to, to, to really put a stop to it. And we, we do need that, that roadmap that, to turn off the tap and say we need to turn off that oil tap before the oil stops flowing. Brilliant. Uh, the next question is, uh, how will an independent Scotland do everything that uh, you've said in your uh, wonderful presentation and cope with an ageing population? Ah, we have a book coming out about exactly that <laughs> by Christmas. Um, What's it called? It's called, uh, well, we haven't quite finalised the, 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 um, the, the title yet, but it could be something like uh, A Future for All of Us. Um, and it does look at that that issue of people aging. Um, one of one of the things that we're really hoping to do is close the, the large gap between life expectancy, which is currently in the 70s for Scotland, and healthy life expectancy, which can be as low, low as the mid 50s in parts, parts of Scotland. And we're starting to see the issues with things like retirement age creeping up, but that healthy life expectancy staying low. So people are quite simply not well enough to work, but still expected to work sometimes for decades. Um, so if anything comes out of that Green, green New Deal, if, if making our, our society healthier uh, and more personally resilient, and, and that helps us to, to, to remain active, uh, I'm not saying we should be chained to our work forever. We should, should also be work, looking at working less and working more flexible, flexibly, especially approaching retirement. Um, but maybe that's one of the th outcomes of, of, of this programme. Uh, Beth has asked, how do we pay for all of this, given the giant recession we will see after COVID? Mm. The thing about recessions is when they happen, a lot of money in the private sector looks for somewhere safe to go to, and there's very few things safer than government bonds. Governments, especially if they have their own currency, do not default on their bonds. So they can issue that in almost unlimited amounts because there's a lot more money out there looking for somewhere to go that, um, than, than governments can use, frankly. So we are saying we, that the, the Green New Deal can be can be funded through um, through Green New Deal a Green New Deal bond, um, and actually, when, since we wrote that paper, the average interest rate that countries like the UK are paying has gone down. So it'd be even cheaper to do than we have in the book. In some countries, the bond 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 rates are now negative, so people are paying the government to hold their money. So yeah, the the, the fact the numbers involved are huge. 
but the, the actual way of financing it is, is routine effectively, we'd be doing it the same way that we've already paid for the COVID um, response. Amazing, thank you. Um, uh, another anonymous attendee question. Scotland has a drug use and homelessness problem, uh, which is a national disgrace, big words. Uh, if they can't solve these issues now, when uh, the governance around them is completely within their power, how are they going to do everything else uh, mm. that you've mentioned in your plan? This is a very complex and multifaceted problem. This is not to, not to simplify it. Um, a lot of the prob a lot of the, the root causes of this is is poverty and deprivation. Um, so it, it is going to involve a, a lot of years of, of redeveloping um, communities that have been effectively abandoned, often for decades, often for multiple generations. Um, it's not going to be a quick fix. That's a terrible phrase considering a drug problem. I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> Um, um, it's difficult it's to use going, other phrasing. Be, it's not going uh, completely, un, completely unrelated, but the, 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 the homonym is unfortunate. It's not going to be a rapid solution. It's not going to be taken care but of quickly. Is, no, it's not going to be taken care of quickly. But that process of making society more equal and more resilient and, 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 and generally more inclusive is what, one that should and must uh, benefit the people who have been blighted by, by, by the drug epidemic and by homelessness. Uh, another anonymous attendee question here. What is the policy of Commonweal be the very expensive, wasteful and dangerous nuclear energy and nuclear weapons? <laughs> nuclear weapons. If the very first thing that an independent Scotland does is sign the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, I will be a very, very happy man. Um, we, we, we've, um, We've got, uh, got, we've worked very closely with groups like Scottish CND to, to, to show how these, these weapons can be removed from Scotland very quickly um, and permanently. Um, on nuclear energy, I know people do look at that as a, a low carbon energy source. Um, and it's, I'm not entirely against nuclear energy per se. My background's in physics. Um, so I kind of know, I know people who work in the industry. I almost went in there myself before I got into politics. I'm a very different person now. Um, however, we don't have time to build nuclear, nuclear energy plants and finish the Green New Deal. So investing in those at the risk of taking that money away from renewable energy um, would, be, would be detrimental. Uh, thank you. And the other thing worth saying uh, for anybody who who is uh, not gone and checked out the Peace Cranes exhibit that we have at St. John's Church, uh, please go and do that because it's a harrowing and simultaneously very beautiful uh, reflection on nuclear weapons and uh, what they are unfortunately mm -hmm. capable of. Uh, so please, uh, if you haven't, go and do that. I think this is a response uh, from the person that asked the question, they said, but we produce the arms for the UK. Yes, uh, they are, but they are, they are part of the, the UK's nuclear programme um, and they are based in, um, in three, primarily in three bases, two of which are in Scotland. The, the point about the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is that it will offer a, a legally binding roadmap for the removal of those, of of weapons from states hosting them. If the it would be an ideal opportunity for the UK to to simultaneously disarm itself, given the technical issues involved in in rebasing them, um, if it chooses to do that, great. And un, again, under the Treaty of Prohibition nuclear of nuclear weapons, Scotland would be compelled to encourage the UK to sign TPNW and to denuclearize. Um, but if they choose not to, then the consequences for them are, are as they will be. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. Uh, how will Scotland, as a new independent state, make it stand on the international stage regarding the situation in Afghanistan now and in the five to ten years to come? I mean, I presume by that lovely person who asked the question, you mean the five, ten years following independence. So um, that's how I'm going to pose the question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Scotland would be uh, a medium-sized country within a, a Northern European 
geopolitical bloc. Um, what can we do uh, in the international stage as that? Well, stop invading other countries is, is one, <laughs> one thing. Uh, um, perhaps reduce the, the UK's ability to invade other countries. More seriously, uh, I would love to see um, Scotland hold itself up as a piece to uh, as a place to negotiate peace. Uh, Norway has done quite a bit of, bit of this uh, and providing those sort of peace envoy diplomatic roles to help people uh, solve conflicts in a uh, uh, in a nonviolent way um, and provide the the resources and support to do that. I would love to see. Scotland shipbuilding produced things like hospital ships, not so useful for landlocked Afghanistan, perhaps, but for other places in the country where there are crises, where Scotland can then deploy or hit or work in a coalition to help deploy um, medical me medical aid and reconstruction aid. You know, there are things that we could be part of and bodies already starting to, already in existence that Scotland could throw its weight behind to, to, to be that force for peace in the world. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, the question is, how do you avoid the worst side of nationalist style politics? And I'm, I'm going to sort of expand this out a little bit. Uh, this was a question I wrote down, which is to say that a lot of what you're talking about with the Green New Deal feels like it's very sort of, uh, there is a foundation of Scotland getting a referendum and becoming independent. But I'm, I'm curious, because obviously, you know, you're a very smart person, you would have thought this through. If independence wasn't voted for, or if a referendum was not granted, would it mean that Scotland just about continued the trajectory it's on now, or would that in effect be detrimental? And is there any sort of unionist argument that could be made that would potentially be able to acknowledge and take in the benefits of the of the new green deal as you've been talking about or is all of this very 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 much sort of undeniably ironclad linked to scotland having the powers to be able to go and uh take control over a lot of these issues a uk driven green new deal that both understood and worked for Scotland would by necessity be very a very decentralised plan, a national strategy delivered locally, um, just with, um, in fact, very similar to the, the one we're advocating, which is also national strategy delivered locally. It would just have a different definition of national and local. Um, to do that, it would involve delivering a lot of the powers we say we need to, to, to create that Green New Deal. Um, perhaps just slightly in a slightly different way from, from independence. Um, the issue is there seems to be absolutely no political will to, to create that kind of Green New Deal, or, or a Green New Deal at all. If it does happen, it's going to be a very centralised command and control one. So that's my dilemma there. Um, on the, 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 the more nationalist politics side of things, I think Scotland has actually done something very significant in terms of its dem democracy to, to, to sort of tamp down in that nationalism. And that was through the, the, the Electoral Franchise Bill. Scotland has broken the link, fundamentally broken the link between citizenship and democracy. You do not have to be a citizen to vote in Scotland. Anyone who is permanently resident in Scotland can now have a say in our democracy. And I think that could be a very, very powerful thing of linking the democracy of Scotland to the people who live in Scotland, not the people who were born here. Um, I, I, I would, Scotland has spent a lot of time talking, trying to detoxify the nationalist word, the N word, uh, because it's still very powerful in Europe. Uh, a very powerful aversion to, to nationalism in Europe. We came up with that term through the early 90s, civic nationalism, um, you know, working for the nation of Scotland, not the, 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 the nationals called Scots. Uh, and that did help, but it's still something in Europe that is viewed with suspicion uh, to a certain degree. Moving to that kind of post-nationalist vision of Scotland, through things like the democratic enfranchisement of everybody in the country. I think that's that's quite an encouraging thing. I'm not entirely sure if everyone who voted for the electoral franchise bill quite saw it that way, but I think it could be. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I do have one uh, question left from an attendee, um, but attendee who's written rather than a massive festival, what about support for small local festivals? Uh, oh, Craig does know what the context of this is. So great. Take it away, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, um, let's not just fill up Edinburgh once again with something. When I say festival, it really should be festivals across everywhere. It should be promoting the local cultural scene in your in your place and encouraging you to go to other places to to, to see their cultural scene as well. Um, I. I, I had been booked to give a talk at uh, the 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 Dune the Rabbit Hole um, uh, festival uh, a couple of weeks ago. I know politics at a music gig. <laughs> it's weird, <laughs> but they they always they always have a a, a Dune University a wee tent where people give interesting talks about interesting things. And I'd been booked for that. Unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions, they had to cancel um, uh, that festival. That very much looking to forward to going back in a future year. I think that could be quite fun. Yeah, I mean, uh, opening act, that feels definitely like a circuit that, uh, that it, you can get involved in. I love to tell people, I have spoke, I, I have had a gig at the Edinburgh, Fr Edinburgh Fringe three times, <laughs> right on the very, very edge of the fringe in a small shop about <laughs> 10 minutes drive away from the centre of Edinburgh but it was an official fringe gig so it counts <laughs> it was a it was a fringe fringe gig um we're we're coming up to quarter past I have one last question that I want to throw out there to you um which is that obviously and you wrote this into your talk we live in a very neoliberal society at the moment there's a lot of power that's concentrated in a lot of very wealthy individuals who get away with a lot of uh, very naughty practices and you know we're living in a world now where companies have uh, resources larger than some nations and I'm just wondering how how that dynamic plays into everything that you've been talking about is it a, is there a sense that do you think that an independent Scotland could manage to bring some of those companies and organizations on side or that this is going to need to happen in spite of that or that they are sort of the enemy at this like how how do you know the amazons of this world play into the the civic responsibility that is at the heart of this uh deal some of them won't is, is a simple fact um when we start talking if you if you think about a lot of your your consumer goods, um, your, your your mobile phones and etc. A lot of these do not fit into the circular economy and have to be redesigned to do it. There's going to have to be a, a, a strong sense of producer responsibility that, that people that manufacture goods are responsible for them throughout the whole lifetime of them. So the goods have to be redesigned to fit into the circular economy. And some manufacturers will do that. Some manufacturers will do it because it's a prestige thing. You can get phones that are a bit fairer and a bit more modular, a bit more repairable. But ultimately, it won't happen until essentially essentially legislation forces them to. Um, and there may be some places that simply don't work in the Green New Deal in the same way because their entire business model is about extracting profits and shipping them through tax havens to maximise them. If those companies want to exist after the Green New Deal, well, they'll have to change. The same goes for the extractive economies like the oil, the oil companies that are trying to green up their portfolios so they don't look like the, 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 the evil polluting overlords that they have been for the last half century. Um, but to complete that transition, they're probably going to have to be gently encouraged through force of law. Um, I, I, I don't see any other way of, of, of saying that, really. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. And that, that takes us down a whole other rabbit hole. But Craig, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, for, thank you for coming in and talking to us. Uh, lovely attendees, similarly, thank you so much for, uh, for coming and enjoying Craig's uh, wonderful uh, talk that he's given. Um, we will stick around if there is... Yeah. Uh, anything else that people want to ask or if there's any other bits and pieces that people have but otherwise um, it was really lovely to see slash sort of see you all and have a lovely evening
And if this was the most fun talk of the Just Festival, maybe reread your program again. I'm sure. That's <laughs> <a good idea. laughs> I had fun, <laughs> but I'm very biased. <laughs>